that works. So it's great to see you all. Thank you very much for being here. And it's a terrific pleasure to be able to introduce Martin O'Neill this afternoon, uh, one of our own, um, come back to his former haunts. So Martin did his PhD here, I think under the supervision of Tim Scanlon, is that right, Tim? Um, so he, he start, you, start, you start off as a moral philosopher and has ascended to being a political <laughs> philosopher. <laughs> So he did a dissertation on freedom, fairness, and responsibility, and now has turned his attention to the question of normative um, concerns related to the institutions that structure the political economy, in effect. So he um, co-edited an important book called Property Owning Democracy, Rawls and Beyond, which started from the insight that although Rawls does have things to say about institutions, not many people had taken that, that seriously or done that much with it. And so it's a terrific volume of essays uh, reviewing that concept um, and alternatives alongside it. Um, he has forthcoming in 2018 another volume called Taxation and Political Philosophy. And his own work um, at the moment concentrates um, on such a, a, a mention called As Equals, Overcoming Inequality, and a book for a broader audience, The Idea of Liberty. So you can see that the core concepts of political philosophical tradition are where he is now taking us, but in relationship to institutional questions. And so this evening, he will guide us through um, his work on justice, justification, and monetary policy. So thanks, here we come. <laughs> Thanks very much, Danielle. Um, it's absolutely lovely to be back at Harvard, always like a, a fantastic pleasure. It's disturbing how many years ago uh, it is now since I uh, was here uh, more regularly. Um, but it's a, a particular delight to be uh, back at the, uh, the Safra Center for Ethics, where 15 years ago, this hardly seems credible given how young I am and how young Arthur is as well. But 15 years ago when I was a graduate fellow here and, and Arthur uh, looked, after, uh, looked after us very, very nicely back, back then. Um, so it's, it's really tremendous um, to be back. So I've set myself a bit of a challenge today uh, to talk about a subject that political philosophers I think haven't really talked enough about but which I hope um, might get a little bit more uh, attention um, in the in the future, and a topic that really um, requires hopefully a little bit of uh, of kind of explanation of what the kind of relevant institutional background is before one can get on to the uh, the relevant sort of normative issues. But I'll, I'll see what I can do um, in the time uh, in the time available. So let me start with with this chap. So. This is Willem Boiter, who is um, the chief economist at City, uh, City Group, um, an academic economist, and also a former member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy uh, Committee. And this is what Boiter says about uh, the role that central banks have had um, in regulating the economy since the great financial crisis. So Boiter says, the economic and political importance of central banks has grown markedly in advanced economies since the, since the start of the great financial crisis in 2007. An unwillingness or inability of government to use counter-cyclical fiscal policy has made monetary policy the only stabilization tool in town. The increased power and at times arrogance of unelected and unaccountable technocrats, he's talking about himself, right? So that's unelected and unaccountable technocrats technocrats is largely due to established political institutions and processes failing to handle the great financial crisis and its aftermath um, effectively. So that's where, where, we are, um, where we are now. So I want to ask kind of two kinds of interlinked questions about the role that central banks have now in, um, in the in macroeconomic management, in the kind of structuring of the uh, the economic conditions that, that, that we face. So one's a question about social justice. So does the role being played by central banks help to bring about more socially just outcomes or do the kind, does the kind of role that central banks 
reform actually makes uh, social justice more difficult to achieve. And one issue there is I want to look in particular at the role that monetary policy has had over the last 10 years or so in exacerbating levels of economic inequality, especially wealth inequality. And then there's a second question that follows from the first that's a question about public justification. So is the new more important role being played by central banks consistent with standards for the public justification of economic policy within democratic societies? And then I think there's a third issue about the interrelation of those two questions, right, and about how questions of justice and justification uh, uh, work together there. So let me start with um, what hopefully will be a kind of a one-minute version of why we have independent central banks. So I guess in many jurisdictions, this was an issue that was thought about a long time ago. An interesting thing about the UK, of course, is that we've only had an independent central bank for 20 years. This was a, a new Labour innovation under Gordon Brown. Um, but obviously, if one thinks you know, kind of further back, let's say, to the role of the Bundesbank, uh, this is something that's been a feature of political uh, the regulation of, of economic arrangements for, for longer. So this is the explanation from the European Central Bank website. Um, and it reveals, I think, something deep and troubling in the kind of psychodrama in German economic thinking that kind of that plays out in how we think about institutions. So the standard case is that you can't trust politicians to set interest rates, right? Politicians are untrustworthy. They'll inflate the economy coming up to an election. They'll cause terrible cycles of boom and bust. And the lack of alignment between the electoral cycle um, and the business cycle is such that if you let politicians run things, you're going to have disastrous outcomes that we've all got reason to try to reject. The problems of assurance and credibility and maintaining price stability if you give that role to, um, to elected politicians, which is what we had up until 1997 uh, in Britain. And therefore, elected politicians have a lack of credibility in front of markets as regards um, kind of holding, um, holding a particular line within monetary policy, and it's better to have, uh, to have a, um, a, a technocratic, independent institution to run monetary policy. So this, this beast, this purple monster, terrorizing the innocent young folk in a German uh, market square is inflation, right? The monster of inflation, if you don't watch out, he comes up, he's very charming, he'll put his arm around you, he'll shower you with money, but he brings disaster in his wake. And the good folk at the, at the ECB think that, you know, Given, given that we've got good reason uh, to fear the big purple monster of inflation, clearly um, we've got good reason to, uh, to want to favor uh, institutional arrangements that will save us from, uh, from this purple monster. If we don't, then we might get this. We might get the Zimbabwean $100 trillion note, or we might get the, uh, the specter in, in Weimar Germany of young children playing, uh, playing with with banknotes. So that's the that's the you know the kind of standard story about justification for uh, for independent monetary institutions. And I don't want to argue with that at all under normal conditions. So I agree here with Boiter that under kind of standard conditions that we had up to the Great Financial Crisis, that seems like a, a, a plausible response to a particular kind of technical problem. Says so Boiter, given a mandate that's been chosen by a process that's seen as legitimate. Narrow monetary policy is sufficiently apolitical to be entrusted to expert unelected technocrats. For me, says Boiter, monetary policy involved one instrument, the bank rate, one primary objective, price stability, operationalized as a specific inflation target, and subject to that, the promotion of growth and employment. Simple, really. So that was, that was the conditions that we used to have. But now we're in very different uh, territory, and that's true in the UK, it's true in the US, in the Eurozone, uh, in Japan. So instead, what we have now is what was, uh, in its early days, called a form of unconventional monetary policy, although it's become, I guess, um, more conventional the longer it's there. 
So we have a condition where the zero lower bound of interest rates um, was reached in many uh, jurisdictions. And what the central banks did was, uh, in the words of the Bank of England, they put more money into the economy in order to boost saving, and sorry, to boost spending, and in order to save the economy from uh, a potentially disastrous, uh, disastrous um, collapse. So under quantitative easing, instead of Boyd's straightforward um, process of just um, uh, just the, a, a simple uh, fluctuation according to a particular defined target of, uh, of, of the bank rate. What we instead have is the central bank buying certain classes of assets from insurance companies, from pension funds, from banks and non-financial uh, non -financial firms. And what it buys is different kinds of assets. So uh, it might be different kinds of corporate bonds. In the UK, it was mostly government bonds or gilts that were bought from from these institutions. In doing that, the central bank effectively just creates new money. It creates new balances that are then fed into the economy. To, par to paraphrase uh, Ben Bernanke, the central bank uh, makes use of its, of its printing presses. This process of unconventional monetary policy through quantitative easing has been pursued by the Federal Reserve, by the Bank of uh, Japan. It's been going on longer in Japan than, uh, than elsewhere. By the ECB, which started later than elsewhere and in my own country by, by the Bank of England. So here, and I apologize, this is what PowerPoint slides should never look like, so, um, so forgive me. Here's the Bank of England's account of what they're up to. Um, now, what I want you to notice is that this justification is very much written in the subjunctive voice. There's a lot, there are a lot of mights and maybes. So the Bank of England, here's what they say they're doing. They say, direct injections of money into the economy, primarily by buying gilts, that's UK government bonds, can have a number of effects. The sellers of the assets have more money, so they may go out and spend it. That will help to boost growth. Or they may buy other assets instead, such as shares or company bonds. That will push up the prices of these assets, making the people who own them, either directly or through their pension funds, better off. So they may go out and spend more. And higher asset prices mean lower yields, which brings down the cost of borrowing for businesses and households. That should provide a further boost to spending. In addition, banks will find themselves holding more reserves. That might lead them to boost their lending to consumers and businesses. So once again, borrowing increases and so does spending. That said, um, then there's a, a section about um, helping bank balance sheets. Um, but at any rate, the extra money, once it's worked its way through the economy, results in higher spending and therefore growth. To jump to the end, the end result is more money out in the wider economy. So the Bank of England's public justification for what they're doing is that undertaking this process of asset purchases in order at the end, right, the final results of which would be to get more money out into the economy. This is their diagram showing the different more and less direct transmission mechanisms that get you from uh, bank purchases of government bonds with new uh, balances through to a situation where spending and income increases and you avoid the possible specter of a, of a deflationary cycle. Um, now, as I said, there are a lot of subjunctives there. So in addition to the welcome transmission mechanisms that the bank talks about. Here are some other things that can happen that don't fit so well with the justification of the policy. So in theory, QE should make banks readier to invest in the real economy as their reserves increase. In reality, and this might actually be something that's very welcome in certain cases, banks will end up just holding much larger deposits with the central bank. In theory, rises in asset prices and share prices should make companies readier to invest in production. But what we often see in reality is that companies use that greater wealth to buy back shares and to sort of sit on large cash balances. In theory, rises in asset prices should make individuals readier to spend and to invest in the real economy. But as we see, and this is, uh, for my purposes, one of the most uh, important effects, what often happens instead is that those who benefited from the rising price of assets end up 
holding that wealth, um, as they see um, the price of certain classes of assets go up. So that money might go into classic cars, Warhols, or apartments in the kind of urban centres of, uh, of uh, industrial societies, whether that's London or New York or San Francisco or, or here in Boston. There's some interesting stuff um, in the Financial Times about the effects of QE on the fine wine and art markets, right? So basically, any of the kinds of things that people who might anyway be asset wealthy might want to hold end up rising in price um, as a result of this, uh, this process. Now, that is going to have significant distributive consequences, right? So let's grant overall, I, don't, I have no quibble uh, with the claim that QE brought overall economic benefits. So there's a Bank of England working paper that in the UK case talks about uh, a gain of GDP of something of the order of 50 billion pounds or something like a 3% um, a, a um, uh, rise in relative to, to the baseline in terms of uh, the performance of the economy. But the Bank of England's own distributional analysis, which, in fairness to them, they put very kind of publicly and clearly on their website, um, is pretty interesting. The value of shares and bonds, they say, um, driven up by about 600 billion, roughly equivalent to 10,000 pounds per household, increase in household wealth in the UK, if household wealth were evenly held in Britain. You won't be shocked to know that household wealth is not evenly held in Britain. 40% of the gain go, went to the richest 5% of households. And given what we know about the shape of the distribution of, uh, of asset holdings, most of that gain goes to the top of the top distribution. So the Guardian did some number crunching, which see there's quite large mar margins for error here, which said that for the richest 10% of UK households, the average, so the, you know, the mean increase in wealth was somewhere in the region of between 128 and 322,000 um, pounds. And that's an increase in financial wealth, right, in terms of uh, the financial assets held by households. Doesn't include uh, property, war holes, or um, because this will eventually be a philosophy uh, lecture pre phylloxera claret um, either. Um, I'm glad there are a few chuckles. Um, the Bank of England analysis also shows that there are negative effects for cash savers. Obviously, this has uh, effects given changes in bond yields for pension holders. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not all, all one way. But clearly, there are momentous distributive consequences from. Uh, this kind of uh, this kind of monetary policy. So the question that, as political philosophers, we ought to be asking is: Is that rise in wealth inequality sufficiently worrying to kind of call into question the justification for that kind of policy, or is it something that we might, in the end, not worry too much about, given that overall there was a beneficial uh, there was a beneficial effect? Now, here's one argument that I think doesn't work. But I had to put it on the slide because it's just sublimely silly. Uh, from the Financial Times, saying that we should worry about QE because, says Financial Times investment editor Meryn Somerset Webb, it stigmatizes the well-off. By having a mechanism that inflates the asset holdings of the very rich, we might create social conditions under which the very rich become stigmatized. <laughs> and therefore, we ought not to pursue such a policy, because obviously it would be terrible if we stigmatized the very wealthy. I won't subject that argument to extended analysis, although there is something wonderful about it. Um, but here, here's the most interesting thing I can find on the justification of, uh, of QE, and a kind of clear-eyed justification that takes seriously the unwelcome distributive consequences as well as the overall effects. This is from Andy Haldane, who's the chief economist of the Bank of England, a very serious, very uh, very impressive figure in many ways, right? So this is a guy who gave a, a talk at Occ the Occupy encampment in London, um, someone who's 
got, you know, a lot of public interventions where he tries to kind of engage in a process of public justification uh, to explain what the bank's doing and to show how it might be, um, it might be a kind of reasonable course of action. So here's what, um, here's what Haldane says. So Haldane says, it's impossible to know for sure how the economy would have performed in the absence of this monetary action. He's talking about the Bank of England QE program. But it seems near certain that the economy would have been materially smaller and asset prices materially lower had this action not been taken. On the bank's own estimates, the UK economy today would have been, so this is uh, writing later than the Martin Wheels analysis, at least six percentage points smaller without the combined effects of lower interest rates and large doses of QE. Or in money terms, we as a nation would have been perhaps 80 to 100 billion poorer. The income pie would have been materially smaller. During this reflationary process, shares of the income and wealth pie have not remained constant. He's absolutely clear and explicit about that. All public policy is redistributional, and monetary policy is no exception, says Haldane. But now here's the argument. But these relativities need to be seen against the backcloth of a rising, not retreating, income and wealth tide. The majority of people, savers and borrowers, old and young, appear to have been made better off absolutely as a result of extraordinary monetary measures. For what it's worth, the bank's own research firmly points in that direction. Of course, some of the losses may be more visible than the gains, and some of the relative losers more audible than the gainers. Um, that's not surprising, I suppose, that although you know, the FT is a counter-example, maybe to the gainers not, not being quiet about their gains. For example, low yields have reduced annuity rates for some pensioners, lowering income streams, but those same low yields have boosted asset prices, raising the value of pension pots. The net effect appears, on average, to have been positive. And extraordinary monetary measures will, of course, not last forever. When they unwind, so too will any distributional effects. In other words, central banks' influence on income and wealth shares is likely to be temporary. Right? I think this is an incredibly rich passage. I think it's got the right form to serve as a public justification for QE. Right? It's a, and it seems like a good faith effort to engage in that process of public justification. Haldane's saying, yes, the central bank action caused increases in inequality, and there are identifiable winners and losers. losers. But, he says, this policy could, in principle, it could be justified individually to each person, or at any rate to most people affected by it, when compared with the policy of doing nothing. And he's got, I take it, three arguments in that passage. So argument one, it saved the economy as a whole from a catastrophic recession. So there's a kind of aggregate effect that's so important that that's... Uh, that that's sufficient reason to do it, despite the bad distributive consequences. Secondly, the absolute effect left the majority, or he says, you know, nearly everyone, better off, right? So you could say to each individual person, look, all right, you might be, um, you might be doing worse off in terms of relativities, in terms of uh, inequality effects, but absolutely you're doing better than, uh, than you were without this. And thirdly, the distributive effects are, at any rate, merely temporary, and they'll be unwound, right? So it's just a kind of transient state of affairs. So three arguments there from, from Haldane. So I think it's got the right form. I think it's a good faith effort. I think it's good that serious people in central banks are engaged in this process. But I think it's pretty clearly, nevertheless, a failure as a... Uh, a justification for the kind of policy that's been done. So here's three, three lines uh, of objection. So firstly, and this isn't something I'll pursue now, but I'll, I'll just register this as, as one thought, that it, this might just underestimate the normative significance of rising inequality. By assuming that the objectionability of significant increases in inequality is offset by comparatively small absolute gains to all or to, to each, right? I'll, I'll, I'll register that thought, but then park it, right? But one might think that inequality is more worrying than Haldane seems to think. 
Now, the second point is one that I want to spend a little bit more time on, which is that there's a problem here with the choice of baseline for comparison. So what Haldane does is to say, look, here's what we did, right? And we might have done nothing at all. And you're all much better off, or each of you is better off, given what we did than, than if we did nothing at all. But the relevant state of affairs for comparison isn't the case where the central bank hadn't done anything, right? Or, you know, where these institutions didn't, um, didn't have a role to play. That seems to assume a lack of other options. And then it doesn't justify this particular set of policies that they did pursue, right? And the question is not whether action rather than inaction in general is justified, but whether this particular suite of policies in particular was justified. So to make a baseline comparison against doing nothing just seems to kind of miss the, miss the, the core of what's actually in question. And thirdly, now this is something I'll come back to, there's something pretty strange about this uh, assumption about unwinding and reversibility. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that closer to the end. Now, I think that Haldane's argument, it's like a kind of, well, it's like a particular kind of misuse of, of Rawlsian type reasoning, where you might kind of, recon you might sort of misconstruct the difference principle as saying, well, look, if there's a gain to the worst off, then what we're doing is justifiable to the worst off. Um, and if there's a gain from doing this particular policy is against doing nothing, then, then that's justifiable. But, I mean, it seems doubly wrong, both because the question seems to be, well, what are the set of different policies between which we're choosing? And is the, um, is the effect for those who are left badly off by this policy, is it not just, you know, kind of okay or better than nothing, but is it as good as it, as it might be? Now, I think that Haldane's, um, Haldane's effort at justification gets into trouble then if we think that there are different things that a central bank could have done, different forms of unconventional monetary policy that a central bank might have pursued other than the particular form that we had. Now, uh, Lawrence Kotlikoff has a nice phrase. He talks about QE as random redistribution something that creates some of the stimulus of a Keynesian transfer, but without the targeted nature of, say, an increase in welfare payments to the less well-off. Um, but, of course, Kotlikoff has been too kind to QE there, because it's not random redistribution, it's regressive redistribution, right? It's much worse than random redistribution. What it is, it's a redistribution to the holders of, of financial assets in the first instance, and then to the holders of other assets as those uh, as that works through um, the economy, which may, which, you know, has particular kinds of trickle-down effects, but which works through, you know, even the Bank of England's own diagram, the transmission channels are basically working through um, primary effects that, that are on um, the holders of, 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 fin of financial assets. So, how on earth could there be a case for pursuing um, what would be at best random and at worst highly regressive uh, strategies if there were other more equitable options uh, available. So here are, here are five alternatives, uh, five things that a bank might have done. And I think that there's not, well, just to step back for, for half a second, I think one role that we as political philosophers ought to be having in these sorts of debates is to say, right, if the economists are telling us there are these five options, what's normatively to be said in favor or against some of these different options, right? And I think there's, we're not doing enough of that yet, but hopefully there'll be more of that to come. So you could have targeted debt relief. You could kind of create balances and just bail out mortgage holders directly. That's something that that Paul Krugman talks about. And if you think about the, the transmission channels that the Bank of England have, that gives you a shortcut very quickly uh, from the left to the right-hand side of, of that kind of Bank of England diagram. You could have, as Mark Blythe and Eric Lonergan um, and Simon Rent Lewis have all uh, advocated, do something that, that Milton Friedman talked about uh, many years ago, helicopter money, right? The idea that, well, look, you're... 
you want to avoid the, the kind of deflationary spiral, send up a helicopter over an urban center and just drop notes onto the people below. That would be random uh, redistribution. Um, but it wouldn't be as um, regressive as, um, as what was actually uh, done. You could have, as uh, Adair Turner, a former chair of the British Financial Conduct Authority, and now chairman of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, says, he says, well, why not direct monetary finance? Why not just have central banks print balances that go directly to treasuries to fund whatever kind of social program that you, that you might want to have? You could have as, as um, um, different kinds of green quantitative easing or um, infrastructure-based quantitative easing. There's a proposal from uh, the Democracy Collaborative, a, a, a US think tank based in, in Washington, to use QE to just buy up, um, buy up the fossil fuel industry and kind of fund the transition to a low carbon economy through QE. Or you could to, um, kind of half borrow an idea of, uh, of James Mead's, um, Mead, uh, British Nobel Prize winning economist, was a, an advocate of kind of sovereign, egalitarian sovereign wealth funds. Um, you could think about funding those through some kind of QE type mechanism. So Stuart, Stuart Weiss and I have got a piece forthcoming where we, we advocate that. Um, I mean, who knows whether that's, you know, the best idea um, the, the out there or whether some other, uh, some other kind of um, mechanism would be better. But at least, you know, my claim is that all of these look better than what was actually done. Um, so there's Krugman. Krugman said, since a large part of our economic troubles can be attributed to the debt home buyers ran up during the bubble years, an obvious way to improve the situation would just be to reduce the burden of that debt. So, you know, that was, he was writing when in 20... 12 or so, I guess, then. But the thought that, you know, that that's a role that the central bank could have played much more directly, but, but didn't. And there's, there's, I shouldn't be left near PowerPoint. You know, there's just, there's various people. But the, the one thing I should say about this slide, James Mead, my, a great hero of mine, uh, is there standing in front of a model of the British economy that was constructed using like water and pipes and valves and like one thing, you know, the rate of inflation is like how much you wind this thing and like you can, and say, so, and this thing lived in, I think it still lives in the, in the British treasury, this kind of machine that was built in order to model. Um, but anyway, that's, um, um, that's not something I'll, we can come back to Mead. Um, so here's my suggestion. I think that, any of these options look like they could have had the good effects that actually existing QE had, but could have avoided some of the, regress the regressive distributive effects that actually existing QE actually had, right? So if um, the justification for QE is, as the Bank of England suggests, about raising demand in the short to medium term, Right, then some of those first solutions, right, the helicopter money or the, um, the direct kind of release to households or whatever might look better. If the justification is different, if there are worries about secular stagnation or underinvestment, then it might be some of the kind of more infrastructure um, facing or kind of large investment fund versions of QE might be better. But with any of these policies, there would be a way of calibrating the distributive uh, effects of quantitative easing in order to make it less regressive. And so it seems to me that there's no reason in principle to think that you couldn't have the welcome macroeconomic effects of actually existing quantitative easing without the kinds of um, regressive distributive effects that the analysis of what was done suggests was there. So my simple suggestion, I think that, you know, this is a kind of boringly I'm not even nailing my colors to the mast of any one of these particular alternatives. I'm just making the boring claim that a more egalitarian version of QE, composed of some subset or combination of the approaches outlined above or some, some other alternative, which realize the welcome stimulus effects of actually existing QE, but without the same capacity for driving up wealth inequality, should be preferred to the QE policies that we've actually seen um, in recent years. So Haldane's justificatory claim fails 
When you move beyond this illegitimately narrow set of comparator policies, as soon as you consider the broad range of possible courses of action, then his justificatory strategy should actually lead you towards the endorsement of a more egalitarian approach to monetary policy. So, that's really what I want to say about the injustice of QE. But I want to say something now about the, its justification. And I think the fact that these better alternatives weren't on the table and weren't under discussion connects up with the, the way in which monetary policy is made in the US and the UK, in the Eurozone, in Japan and, and elsewhere. Um, so, as I said at the start, things were fine when the central bank had a very simple role, and meeting that role was a merely technocratic, uh, a merely technical question. But then there was a kind of difficulty that fell on the banks when they had to move to a more imaginative and broader response to, um, to the economic situation. And what that meant was, so in the British case, it looked like the safest thing you could do was just buy government bonds from large financial institutions. If you because that, that looks, it, it has a kind of surface appearance of neutrality. And then, okay, there's distributive consequences down the road, but they're not kind of there front and center as they would be if what you were doing were funding, was funding some sort of direct transfer to the household sector. But connected with that, there's a lack of public debate, right? I think in all, all, of, um, all of these societies about options for monetary policy that's driven by the fact that this has just been a boring technical question in years gone by. Now, it's no longer a kind of boring technical question, but that lack of public uh, scrutiny and discussion is still there. There's a kind of lack of awareness of what the range of different options for monetary policy might be. Um, there's problems of elite groupthink within uh, banks. Broader interests often don't get uh, don't considered. So here's just a really, again, a boringly minimal claim. I think that given this kind of reinforcement between the anti-democratic nature of, of, of the decision-making, well, sorry, my claim is that there's a connection between the kind of elite anti-democratic way in which these policies are arrived at and the consequences of these kinds of policies. Sanjay Reddy, the economist, put this very nicely where he said, it matters a great deal who the people in the room are when these decisions about policy selection get made. Decision-making procedures that we actually have just don't fit with what we're owed as democratic citizens by the institutions that govern the economies that we live and work in. Um, so there's both an inegalitarian undemocratic procedure and then we get outcomes that are inegalitarian as well. Amartya Sen puts it quite nicely where he says that you know, monetary policy ought to be a matter of democratic debate, not decided in secluded financial corridors. So my minimal claim is that that's not good enough. right? Given the role that these um, monetary policy setting institutions have in the structure of the economy, that's not good enough within a democratic society to allow this kind of elite technocratic decision making that has these very momentous uh, distributive um, consequences. The problem is with this unjustifiable attempt to depoliticize decision making on what just are irreducibly normative political decisions. Who should win? Who should lose? What should be the, the focus of these policies? This, there isn't a technical answer to this other than in a highly circumscribed domain. As soon as there's a broader role for these institutions, the, the Choosing to go with the technocratic solution is it's, a, it's kind of just a it's a decision to not take seriously the political nature of the, of the choices being made. Democratic deliberation gets locked out, political discourse is impoverished, and a full range of voices, interest groups, and constituencies just don't get a say in how these uh, decisions uh, are made. So, um, so I think that the institutions we have are unjust and unjustifiable um, as well. And I, my claim is that, um, although that seems in one way a radical 
uh, pair of claims that it's actually a very boring uh, and kind of just, <laughs> well, I think it's a set of claims that under, under uh, pressure don't seem that controversial, although I'm sure many of you will disagree with them. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with three thoughts. So one is about um, the particular relationship between um, uh, between QE and austerity. One is about what I call two dogmas of central banking. And then I'm going to say a little bit about rules just at, at the very end. So a particularly nasty element of public policy in Britain has been the combination, what I call the QE austerity two-step, right? The combination of contractionary uh, um, public policy that cuts benefits, that cuts transfers to the least well off, that cuts expenditure on social programs, at the same time that you have expansionary monetary policy that works through transmission mechanisms that primarily are about the, uh, that start with the wealth of, of asset holders. So the effects of fiscal austerity are felt disproportionately by the poorest and the most vulnerable. Those, in other words, most dependent on government spending through social transfers and the provision of public services. QE creates widespread economic benefits through, as we've seen, notably inefficient trickle-down mechanisms, inflating bank balance sheets and the asset wealth of the rich on its way to increasing ag aggregate demand in the economy. So we've had this curious combination of policies that kind of cuts at the bottom and feeds in at the, at the top. Um, now, as the German uh, economist uh, Birgitta Young has pointed out, there's a gender dimension uh, to this as well. This combination, the particular combination of fiscal and monetary policies that we've had is notab notably bad for women and better for men, right? So if more of those who are large asset holders are men rather than women, and more of those who uh, work in the public sector or are dependent on transfers of uh, are women rather than men, if there's that kind of, um, that kind of um, shape to, uh, to the consequence of those policies, then that, the combination of QE and austerity has this kind of gender inegalitarian dimension. Perhaps even more strikingly, there's obviously a huge issue of intergenerational justice here, given that asset holders are predominantly older rather than younger, right? And part of the explanation for why younger people have been excluded from the housing market, you know, in London, for example, in, in my country, is that it's to do with, I mean, a bunch of things, among which is the, uh, the effect of QE on inflating the, uh, the price of, um, of housing. So this two-step arrangement it's pretty troubling because austerity makes QE all the more necessary, right? So if you have austerity that strips demand out of the economy through cuts to public investment and the reduction of the incomes of the poor, then it's all the more necessary to have kind of reflationary monetary policy. But QE also makes austerity possible, right? This was certainly the case in the UK. QE made it possible to significantly reduce the income and welfare of the disadvantaged in society without crashing the economy as a whole or undercutting the possibility of economic growth. The windfall gains to the wealthy took the place of much needed services and incomes for the poor in propping up the economy overall. Now that's a pretty worrying combination of policies, I'll modestly suggest. Um, but in case that was getting a bit too uh, a bit too um, doer or heavy. Um, here's two dogmas of central banking. And so going back to the third element of Haldane's argument, Haldane says that extraordinary monetary measures will, of course, not last forever. When they unwind, so too will any distributional effects. His idea seemed to be that when the bank reverses a QE purchase through selling the purchased asset, the bank's action is somehow erased. Its consequences are eradicated from the world. That's magical thinking, right? That's just not a plausible model of what happens in uh, reality. So I have, so one point is that one might be waiting a long time for the unwinding. 
bank, the bank of uh, Japan has QE purchases that are still not unwound 15 years uh, after they're uh, been on the books. But there, there's what I call here two objections, the Heraclitus of Ephesus objection and the steamroller objection. Heraclitus of Ephesus said that you could never step into the same river twice. Well, a central bank can never intervene in exactly the same economy twice. Right? Every monetary intervention is in a particular economy at a particular stage in, stage in time with particular people who are alive and active and in particular uh, at a particular life stage with particular asset holdings within that economy. If you then do something, um, something that reverses that purchase five or ten years later, you're in a different river and you're in a different economy. So that idea of reversibility in anything other than a kind of narrow technical sense that, well, you can reverse the transaction, but you don't reverse the consequences of the transaction. And it's very puzzling that anyone would think that. Um, this connects with what I call the steamroller objection. If you're run over by a steamroller, the way to reverse those effects is not to have the steamroller reverse back over you and return you <laughs> to good health. Um, the second dogma is, um, and this is something that I've not taught much about, but I, I think connects with the thought that there just hasn't been sufficient scrutiny to the kind of conceptual or normative thinking around monetary policy. So this idea of a central bank balance sheet. So if you start reading uh, discussions of economists about central banks, they're very worried about balance sheets and about the shape of central bank balance sheets. So Adair Turner, an advocate of direct monetary finance, an advocate of transfers from central banks to governments, right, which is a heretical uh, left field view for an establishment economist to have. He's worried about the balance sheet of the central bank, right? So the thought is, well, what if the central bank uses, um, uses QE uh, to invest in, um, in particular uh, projects that then don't, don't have a return, right, in risky, uh, in risky um, financial instruments? Well, there might be losses that would need to be paid for by government subsidy and ultimately by taxpayers. So he thinks if the central bank makes a loss, the Treasury has to come and bail out the, the central bank. Then he has a footnote where he says, in fact, there's no absolute necessity for central banks to be solvent in accounting terms. Um, but that shouldn't be a footnote, right? That's a fundamental point about these institutions, right? In some way, they're like banks. In other ways, they're not like banks, right? So in a, in a society that has its own currency, where the central bank has, as we've seen, the ability to create, uh, to create new deposits, to worry, as Turner does, even in the course there of making a sort of heretical uh, suggestion about direct monetary finance, to worry about balance sheets as if these were commercial entities out there in the economy like others. I think, I mean, in Wittgensteinian, uh, language shows someone in the grip of a picture, um, and it's a picture that ought to be, uh, ought to be, uh, we ought to be freed from. We have to avoid, I think, what I call the soft tyranny of accounting categories, that then leads us to misunderstand the nature of some of these central institutions of economic governance in the societies that we live in. Um, and you know what we see there, even with you know one of the most, um, one of the most radical and interesting thinkers about finance and monetary policy, I think, shows that, that these sorts of problems are there. So I'll finish with rules, given where I am. Um, that seems appropriate. Um, so I think there's three mistakes about social justice that are embedded in our current monetary arrangement. So as discussed, even the best justifications for QE, the kind of thing one sees with Andy Haldane, have the form of contractualist arguments, but they're failed contractualist arguments. They don't actually provide a justification that, that's successful. That's the first point. Secondly, I think there's a failure to treat citizens as free and equal in Rawlsian terms. If the basic approach to economic management is deliberately removed from the democratic public political culture, if these things aren't subject to public scrutiny and debate, Policymaking in a democratic society 
should allow real democratic input. It shouldn't be a process of broad technocratic discretion in secluded corridors. The third point in, in Rawlsian terms is that if anything is part of the basic structure of society, central banks are. Right? Principles of justice apply then holistically to the institutions of economic management taken together. Right? It, it, they apply to the suite of institutions and policies that they pursue collectively. So there's a fundamental tension between what one might call the holism of justice and then the institutional division we have between fiscal and monetary policy. And we're in a very strange situation where insofar as political philosophers might think about economic policy or economic institutions, we might have debates about tax rates and their distributive consequences, but then just not turn our attention to the monetary institutions in that society that are part of the overall suite of, of institutional structures that create particular kinds of outcomes that then have an effect on the kinds of uh, lives that people lead. So my concluding claim is that what we really need, what we're entitled to as democratic citizens, are different arrangements for conducting monetary policy. We need more democratic economic institutions that take seriously that point about the holism of justice and don't take this sort of merely technical distinction between fiscal and monetary policy that's broken down in reality under, um, under the pressure of circumstances after the great financial crisis that's meant that central banks have had to uh, expand their role. We shouldn't let that distinction stop us think about the justice and justification of the, the full set of our, of our economic institutions. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Martin. That was just a terrific example of bringing the rigor of normative analysis to key questions in contemporary political life. Um, Arthur? So I learned something important today that I'm uh, young enough to be really aggrieved at the distributional consequences of Britain's quantitative easing. I, I, I never realized I had a reason to be aggrieved about that. Uh, Martin, you, you have used a uh, very impressive steamroller to squash what for many of us is a um, not very plausible argument. So I think we're all with you uh, at a certain level of generality. Um, it's also very refreshing to see someone engage in pra the practicalities of actual policy and political history. But I, I think that your talk is kind of awkwardly uh, either too detailed or not detailed enough. And I think in part you haven't quite identified what is the most interesting, I mean, identify the most interesting normative question here. But I don't think that you actually addressed it. Um, look, I don't think anyone would disagree that a central bank is part of the um, uh, basic structure and therefore in a, under perfect institutions, uh, it would be able to uh, address the things that you wanted to address. It turns out that our central banks are not. Um, there, some of them are not legally, I think at least some of your creative ideas are actually not within the legal purview of at least some of, some of the central banks. But even if they are, and this is where you're in some respects not practical enough, they're not politically within the purview. I mean, your, your two-step is a two-step for a particular reason. We have major, major governments, more so in Europe than here, but even here, who are pursuing, pers uh, who are democratically pursuing austerity policies, right? They uh, are doing absolutely the backward thing that they should be doing, and you're expecting political, in political equilibrium that a central banker is supposed to stand up and say, oh, because you know our governments aren't Keynesian, I'm going to be Keynesian. And how long do you think it will take before those central bankers are actually face legislation that put them out of business? So um, the, the real challenge that the, the real central bankers who kind of understood the situation face is that they're facing a completely ass backwards fiscal policy, and they're trying very hard to do the right kind of fiscal policy through monetary policy. They have a very, very hard problem. Um, and I'm not sure that philosophers can say very much about that. What I think philosophers can say something about, and you alluded to this, but didn't actually dig in except to say something about democratic accountability, is um, there is truth to the original idea behind central banks, that we want a little bit of day-to-day um, -day political distance from certain kinds of 
decisions, just like we want Supreme Courts to, have, to not be directly elected. Um, so um, paint yourself a hard problem. The hard problem is that um, you have, th through democratic processes, you get actually more austerity. Right? You get disastrous policies. And you want your central banks to be accountable to that kind of politics. Right? So what I think you need to grapple with is what, is the, what, what are the, the normative justifications for any kind of independence on the part of a central bank? And as I said, you've alluded to that, but you actually haven't said very much about that. There's a lot there. Um, so, well, a couple of a couple of thoughts. So, um, I mean, I, I'm not very moved where you talk about the kind of what is or isn't within the legal purview of these institutions as we stand. I mean, I take it that there's one question which is, you know, given the given the kinds of institutions we have in different jurisdictions right now, what ought the people there? to do. And then there's a question, well, what should be the, the kind of the, the mandates and what should be the kind of legal framing for those institutions? Now, if no, one... No, no, would argue with, would argue with the view that a central bank ought to have uh, not just inflation as its goal, but also growth and unemployment and be given the tools to do so. But you also want democratic accountability. So then why do you want a separate central bank? Why don't you just throw it back to Parliament? Well, I mean, in terms of actual mandates, right, so the, the mandate of the Bank of England is simply to hit the 2% inflation target, right? What's in the legislation has nothing about the health of the economy, nothing about employment levels, nothing about anything else. Now, clearly, actually existing institutions look through that and behave, behave differently. But, I mean, in terms of kind of what's, um, you know, what's possible... Um, institutionally, it's worth bearing in mind, I mean, we can get too, too fixated on kind of local, local um, political or institutional problems. And we can lose, lose sight of the fact that there are very different ways of setting these things up. As I say, it's only 20 years ago that we didn't have an independent central bank in the UK, and that, that, that this was a matter um, for democratic governments to set set monetary policy. So it's not it's not kind of that outlandish that that might be uh, that that might be the arrangement that one has. Now on now you're absolutely right to say that you know what you have now often is just disastrous fiscal policy that then the central bankers are trying to kind of correct for. And that that's a very odd so then it seems strange to say well we need more democracy and we need now I don't know. I mean I think there's one might think that the split there between what the technocratic institutions do and what the democratic institutions do just allows a particular kind of political irresponsibility. It gives a particular kind of scope for democratic politicians to not actually kind of be more serious about economic policy and economic management. And it might be that in democratic societies, that kind of insulation ought not to be there, right? So, I mean, you know, thinking about my country, one might think that, you know, George Osborne ought to have, um, ought to have taken more of the, the consequences of the fiscal policies that he, he pursued. So, look, I, I, I mean, I, I completely take your point that, you know, one, one might ask slightly different questions at different levels, depending on what one kind of keeps fixed or doesn't keep fixed. And the, uh, you know, goodness knows, given actually existing constellations of political forces in various jurisdictions, it might be very unlikely to get good policy. But then, right, that's, that shows that it's very important as political philosophers, as people who aren't just thinking about, well, what should be the policy adopted next week or tomorrow, but who are trying to think about the different ways in which these institutions could be organized or different ways of doing things that we do ask some of the questions at other levels of generality and that, that kind of relax some of the um, some of the kind of specific features of our of our current predicament. So I, I kind of so I I, I both um, completely take your points but in a completely unconcessive way. <laughs>
So my question was very much the same uh, as Arthur's, and I want to ask my question, but I just uh, comment on what you said to Arthur. It sounds as one way as if your answer uh, is, I stand by what I said, except I don't think it ought to be done. Uh, that is, that it would be a bad thing if this were just handed to Parliament. If that were the question uh, on the table, uh, you would be inclined to be opposed to it. But you just think as political philosophers, uh, people ought to be thinking what would be better in an ideal world. And so I wonder if that's actually what you're saying to Arthur. But if I could just spin it a little bit my uh, way, the way I would have put it. I would have thought your talk had two uh, parts. The first was a uh, part about the consequences of policies, uh, which was really a pretty technical analysis. Uh, and then the second part of the talk was about who should make the policy uh, decisions, where you put forward the claim that the decisions are, in some sense, irreducibly political, uh, and we shouldn't hide uh, from that. Uh, but it seems to me when you talk about political, there are two senses in which something might be political. It might be political in the sense of being irreducibly value-based. That's certainly true. But then there is another sense of political uh, that um, suggests that the decision ought to be democratic. Uh, politics ought to be democratic uh, politics. And I'm not sure the fact that a decision is value-based always means that it ought to be decided through direct democratic mechanisms, especially when uh, the decision has as technical a component as the first part of your talk uh, suggested that it would. It would be very hard for lots of people uh, to grasp the economic analysis and the um, distributive consequences if they had to decide in an up-down vote. Uh, and so in that sort of situations, are you open to the idea of some sort of mediation and as opposed uh, to the idea that this should be put directly uh, to Parliament or to Congress here uh, in the United States? How would you feel about putting uh, to Parliament or Congress the different question, uh, should the mandate of the central bank be adjusted in such a way that the central bank would have a richer menu of value-based alternatives? Great. Great question. Again, there was a lot, a lot there. So I, I, I should try and nip in the bud the first, uh, the kind of interpretation of my response to Arthur. So I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, thinking about the, the case in the, in the UK, for example, absolutely there should be a different institutional settlement. Now, whether that means, it probably doesn't actually mean a return to the pre-1997 situation, because clearly that, that was a situation where you, had, um, where you had chancellors of the Exchequer making monetary policy decisions for electoral reasons and where you got kind of destructive boom-bust cycles and, and so on. Um, but, it, but it could mean a bunch of different things. It could mean um, more consultation between, uh, between the government and the central bank it could mean, I mean, as you suggest, that, that there are ways in which um, one could have richer mandates, more conditional mandates, more kind of mechanisms for adjusting the instructions from, um, from, from government to the central bank. So I, I absolutely see the value of some mediation there, right? Of, of thinking that um, in one way, these absolutely are difficult technical questions that you know, so I don't think it should be de debated on the floor of Congress or the floor of the House of Commons exactly what the size of the, you know, that month's um, asset purchase um, uh, program should be. So I, I don't think that, but I think there are there are ways in which there ought to be a kind of richer a richer institutional setting that takes seriously the fact that the central bank has this broader role to play. I mean. In Britain, we've had really a crazy situation where the official mandate, as I said to Arthur, just remains hit a 2% inflation target. That's it. And then you have this kind of rich array of, of kind of different policies being, um, being pursued, actually with a much broader uh, array of concerns about employment levels, about, um, about kind of long-run uh, economic stability and so on and so forth, that, that aren't just about what's there in the explicit 
mandate. So you've got this kind of kabuki theater of, of, of uh, where no one's actually taking seriously the, the kind of letter of the, the mandate anyway. Um, on, on technocratic expertise, um, I, I gave a talk about related issues once and a very nice chap came down to talk to me at the end and it turned out he'd been uh, a former deputy governor of the, the Bank of England. And, um, and he said, um, he said, well, you know, one thing you have to realize is we didn't really know what was going to happen when we started this process of QE. We were sort of flying blind. We tried a certain amount of it and then we tried to see what would happen. So I think it's remarkable the degree to which actually this is a domain in which um, the idea of technocratic expertise is in part genuine, but there's some mystification there as well. And even, even the people um, who, under the current institutional arrangements, are there given that role, just you know, don't, have, uh, don't have that high um, an understanding of exactly what the consequences of different approaches might be. There's an awful lot of uncertainty um, at work in this area. Um, but, um, yeah, but thank you for the Hi. Uh, I guess perhaps unsurprisingly, I'm also following up on the past two comments, but um, especially from your responses to Professor Applebaum and Professor Fallon, I'm really confused about uh, when you draw that this down to institutional arrangements, what you would like uh, an administrative agency that handles financial and monetary policy to, to look like. You seem to say at some points that you would want that, you know, you wouldn't want Congress to talk about exact numbers in quantitative easing, but it seems like then you want Congress to then actively debate whether or not quantitative easing um, would be the ideal policy. But then you've indicated that you want some sort of consultation process from the central bank with some some parties of unknown um, like uh, of unknown kind of uh, identity. Um, so um, I'm just curious as to whether you've thought out kind of even at a high level of idealization what uh, 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 an administrative agency handling such policies would start to would start to look like. So. I don't, so just a very kind of general point. I don't think it's our role as like political philosophers to kind of say, right, here is what the institutional structure ought to be, right? I think what we can point to is the need for an institutional structure that um, is able to take more seriously distributive considerations, right, which at the moment, you know, aren't in the, um, in the thinking of these institutions, and that does a better job of um, encouraging a kind of broader democratic debate and that has um, a different kind of relationship to democratic politics. Now, I, I don't... Um, I don't think I've got any expertise in saying exactly what that institutional structure ought to look like. And I'm quite relaxed about that. I mean, not least like, for democratic reasons. I don't think it's you know, about saying, right, here's what, here, according to me, is what the structure should look like. I think um, it's the role that, that one can have um, as a political philosopher trying to contribute to these sorts of debates, is to kind of point to normative deficiencies of the current settlement and point to normative requirements of a better settlement. And I'm sure you know people who are who are much um, much more able to think about these things than than I am can can you know think through what what that might look like. I mean, just one. Um, I mean, I think these. These issues are absolutely, um, they're kind of almost live. Or what One could see a situation, certainly in the UK, where these debates are going to have to be had, right? So um, if at the next election we see uh, a change of government in the UK, 
uh, I mean, the British Labour Party has certainly talked quite extensively about different, different ways of doing monetary policy, different ways in which, I mean, some of these ideas around uh, infrastructure, building QE or kind of green QE or whatever it might be, that's very much kind of within the, um, the sets of things that are being thought about by the current opposition in the, in the UK. Now, what that will look like um, at the level of precise institutional implementation, um, you know, we'll see, hopefully. But um, I think what one shouldn't do is to kind of um, think that what I'm saying is, you know, as Dick suggested, is like, well, no, no, you know, in some far off ideal situation, we should have different institutions, but not, not anywhere around here or anywhere around now. I'm absolutely not saying that, because I think absolutely there are different institutional settlements we could have. And, you know, in some places, we're going to have to figure out quite soon what they might look like. I will ask very non-rich questions because my background in economics is non-existent. I will ask non-rich questions. I'm with the poverty class here. Um, so uh, you say that Haldane offered a, a sort of quasi attempt to be a Rawlsian to appeal to how each person benefits by looking at the absolute level, right? But the thing is that the, the maximization requirement in Rawls, you know, the, making the worse off as well as they can be, is, is I want to know, first of all, whether you accept that as the appropriate standard. And it doesn't seem to be the standard that's applied uh, in the democratic culture at all, right? I mean, uh, none of our economic policies at any level. So why should Haldane feel that he has to appeal to a standard that nobody in the society, except perhaps a few intellectuals, uh, you know, who were Rawlsians accept? So I don't know whether he was trying to do a failed Rawlsian justification or simply trying to do a justification that's in line with the view that, well, Everybody should benefit to some degree, but you know, no maximization of the worse off or even preference given to them. With respect to the other policies that you mentioned, and I think that's very useful that you mentioned these things, I was just wondering, I mean, it, it, it seems like some of them, like the green policy that you mentioned, wouldn't do anything to maximize the situation of the worse off either. Um, it has a particular goal that you might think worthy, you know, but it doesn't do that. And the, the policy of directly paying off debt, I'm just wondering, I mean, suppose somebody is, has money and they burn it, and they're in debt because of that. We could get rid of the problem of the fact that most of these people who burn their money, suppose 60% of the society burns their money, you know, and they can't spend, obviously, anything. We could, you know, just give them money and they'll spend. Well, it seems like that would be an irresponsible thing to do. Uh, and even a Rawlsian, I mean, Rawls didn't think that you had to compensate people for their bad decisions, right? Um, similarly, if people invest in the wrong way or get themselves into debt, you know, they may have been misled by banks into getting into that debt and so forth and so on. It just doesn't seem like the correct policy is to simply eliminate their debt at least without perhaps further constraints on how they spend this new money or something. But again, you know, uh, I just really do have questions. I'm not uh, an expert in this area at all. I'm the poverty-stricken intellectually. <laughs> um, you, you guys all ask very long, <laughs> very tricky questions. <laughs> um, so, so look, absolutely, I'm, I'm I'm not saying that Haldane's uh, view is to be rejected because he isn't a chapter and verse good Rawlsian. I'm absolutely not saying that. But, and absolutely, there's, there's a looser idea of um, kind of significant benefit to each that seems to be at play there, right? So I think what Haldane's saying is, look, no matter who you are, he says, you know, saver or, or borrower, young or old, You've benefited significantly from this policy. You know, enough. Enough for you to kind of think that the policy is a justifiable one. Now, all, um, all I want to say to, to him is, all right, fine, let's take that criteria. You know, let, let's, let's take that criterion, as he puts it, but then say, look, that doesn't work if you think that there's a broader, a broader array of, of things that you, that you might have done. So... Um, I mean, I, I just wanted to kind of 
to sort of, um, you know, flag the, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but, right, but the rejection of the argument doesn't turn on, on that, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah no, sure. Um, on, on sort of, um, on kind of individual responsibility. So, um, I mean, a really interesting thing about, um, so, you know, any, any set of transactions where someone borrows money from someone else, right? There's two parties in, in that, right? There's the, there's the lender and the, and the borrower, right? And, you know, as it happens, we've seen situations where, you know, huge classes of, of transactions that people thought on both sides were a good idea at the time, right? Turned out not to, not to be a good idea, right? And to have very uh, deleterious economic consequences. Now, if we really wanted to kind of hold a tough line on responsibility, we want to avoid mor moral hazard, then what we'd have to have done, presumably, is like, you know, not only no bailouts to the household sector, but no bailouts to banks either, right? All these people made all these bad decisions. So if we really take responsibility very seriously, you've got to let the whole thing fall. You've got to let it all burn down. Right, exactly. Yeah. And I wasn't denying that. Yeah. The question is, uh, you know, where are those overriding and when do they arise? And is there a responsibility factor that should be considered at all? Right? I mean, the Clinton administration, the housing head of the said, we made a big mistake in making these homes available. Okay, so you might say the government was also going to get this money. Okay, but the Southern Supreme the solution is to, you know, to simply get rid of the threat. So, uh, so, I mean, the, so the one, one point to make is that, you know, al almost any approach that you take that's going to kind of keep, keep the show running, which I guess everyone does want, is going to be one that's going to, going to kind of not hold people uh, straightforwardly accountable for certain sorts of prior choices. But I think there's also another point, which is just that if one's thinking about, um, about categories of, um, of different kinds of policies, different kinds of intervention, within the economy, it might, you know, it might just not be plausible to have the kind of responsiveness to individual, um, individual responsibility that, you know, in under, you know, if you're, if you're Jerry Cohen or Dick Arneson or whatever, you think, well, you know, the just thing to do is to have this kind of, um, this kind of responsiveness to individual responsibility. But that, that just might not be a plausible option, right, within, um, within um, making choices about what kinds of policies to have at the level of a, of a whole economy. Um, so I think that, you know, that might be one point where as, um, you know, as, as political philosophers, we might need to be a little bit cautious about kind of the nature of the questions being asked and not, not kind of retreat to, um, to theories that might actually be, be impossible you know, just for epistemic reasons to, to actually implement. Last question, Josh. Oh. My name is Josh. Um, so my two questions are about the relationship... Two questions. Well, no, really, really, really quickly, are about the relationship between monetary policy and institutions that don't feature in your account. The first one is international capital markets. And the argument for it before 2007 was basically that um, international capital markets constrained the possibilities of monetary policy, so it's fine, we didn't need to worry about it. So the justification for getting rid of political accountability was essentially that that was handed over to capital markets and they would do the job. Post-2007, the relationship's almost reversed. International capital markets don't really work like markets and they depend to a remarkable degree on monetary policy. So I wondered how you think that they should feature in your account, uh, and yeah, generally. And then secondly, the state and voting. If by if your argument implies that, um, I mean, to put the question really simply, don't you need to bring monetary policy back into elections given the logic of your argument? And therefore, 
can you really say anything less? For example, if you extend the mandate, is that enough, given the logic of your argument? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to use the lateness of the hour to answer just the second half, because the first half is incredibly difficult <laughs> to answer. So the second half I can give, I think, a more straightforward answer to, which is I think absolutely, um, absolutely monetary policy should be brought back into elections. Now, should it be brought back in at the level of, um, you know, a, a, a manifesto for a potential party of government saying, right, here's what our bond purchase program looks like. For, right, so I don't think that, um, but I think in terms of, um, in terms of um, political parties um, offering either different institutional settlements or changes to central bank mandates, or, I think absolutely that should be part of the the, the kind of the the substance of democratic politics, and it should be um, it should be absolutely under under discussion again. Um, given that we've just got these these institutions that, that have kind of just had to take on a life that, that doesn't, um, that can't really be made sense of in terms of their, their role under kind of earlier, an earlier set of economic conditions. And with, there's just a pressing need insofar as we're kind of deliberating together as democratic citizens thinking about justice to be able to actually have the public debate about what a better way of Doing this might be so. So, the answer to the easier half of <laughs> your two questions is, is yes, absolutely. Thank you.